First question. Who of you were was already attending my talk in the morning on the other side? Okay, three. So please be in mind. Uh, there's a tiny repetition to get everyone on board. You're only three. I think it's still worth it. I'll try to focus then um, most part of, of the thing, which is um, yeah, in addition to the notebook. Ah, yeah, thanks for um, auto going to the next slide. So, um, yeah, that's me. Da -da -da, it worked, it was already automatically. So, um, yeah, let me tell you a bit more um, individual things. So, Joel and IO is actually m my person uh, as of now, still. So, I, I really am kind of a, uh, a single entrepreneur, tried a couple of uh, co founders here and there didn't work out so far, try to think about other ways, but so far um, it's still kind of a good way for me just to do it on my own and try to envision this goal of creating value for, for others and yeah, lots of other companies to then finally make something which hopefully can sustain itself. <laughs> the beginning is always um, a lot of hassle to, to kind of get known and, yeah, and build something uh, really useful. But um, so far, a super interesting challenge, and yeah, you learn a lot. You need to do a lot of different things, which you haven't thought before. And yeah, and I'm super happy that I can be here today, and present to you kind of my current dream. Um, yeah, what I what I'd like to give to the world. Um, yeah. <coughs> so the focus as of now is actually reactive notebook, and because of this, I I want to. Um, yeah, give an overview about this first, which is a bit overlapping to the talk in the morning I already gave. And the second part is then about the, the cloud deployment, so that you can use this already. And yeah, this is also intended to be used by companies. Um, yeah, more about that then later. So cloud.joland.io, this is the, the website where you can just go to and then check it out. You log in with GitHub, and yeah, and then everything is there. Yeah, you get um, automatically a free access period of a couple of hours, but you can just reach out to me, and I'll extend your your test period for yeah up to a month. I usually say, but if you if you're really interested to test it more, uh, we also find a solution. Okay, let's hook into it. Um, so. Uh, so this is a bit surprising. I was hoping... Okay, not works. I was clicking too often. So I have a, a little video prepared as a live demo alternative. So this is kind of the, the key part around... Uh, yeah, everything is around this. Um, some of you s saw this already in the morning. So on the right side we see the key aspect which is a reactive notebook, and um, it's like Jupyter, you have this, these cells, but it's also not like Jupyter, and, and that these cells, they automatically update. If you change something, all which depends on it will be rerun. And the order is not decisive, Yeah, um, you can do the order as you want. Um, so here we see the initial layout, um, which has the output above the input, we can change this. We can also have the output below the input, which is much more intuitive for, for a couple of, and also for me, um, but the default has it on top. And yeah, so we we just imported a square root from math, this one example, and that updated to, to grab the new dependencies. And we, we built kind of rich document, uh, yeah, self-documenting output, for example, with Markdown, but we also could uh, use HTML. So there's a, a similar HTML wrapper around it. So yeah, that what in Jupyter would be two different cell types. Here now is just one of the same cell type. Um, yeah, just a, a markdown string or an HTML string, which is then output and, and rendered um, with, with rich output. So here we have kind of a small LaTeX example that you see that it's the usual 
um, mathematics like uh, Markdown, which you have, and and the key thing is that it's re rendered rich, and the final part of this uh, little animation is that you will see that uh, we can also hide the input. It made, made, makes a lot of sense for, for these pure output cells, and this is now the final step. And yeah, and yeah. So this little example actually computes pi, and yeah. So the core idea is now that we have such an interface, which, um, which as of now looks more, bit like the, like standard Jupyter, but we can now extend it with with graphical inputs and self updates. These are the two things which I want to present you in the next two slides. So that, despite this looks so simple, it's out of a sudden like a full web page or a full um, data process. So it's still, um, yeah. So last bits. Um, now, now we are there. It's still kind of really just a, a script-like thinking. Yeah, you just do something, and it's really like a script. Actually, it's even stored as a script. So what you see here is now stored as a Python file on on the disk, and they are all sorted in the correct order. So that you, if you would execute the Python file, it's really just doing what we have here in the correct order, so the dependencies are resolved. And we use this later on. So let me go to the next slide. Um, so this is now the key part, um, so that that you can get the feeling. Um, this notebook, despite so simple, really can can create whatever you want. So we have, of course, some design defaults, I would say. Yeah, You have the the font which we use here, yeah, we can change this, but but from yeah from just using it, it has a default font. But other than that, yeah, almost everything is free, so free to to be changed. We we can really put whatever we want on the top. We can put a logo on the right, yeah. So we can really adapt this easily to whatever company style we would like. While in Jupyter, because you have this, um, yeah more this the standard experiment cell layout it's not so easy to to just yeah change jupiter into something which is really fully customized to your company there there's still this jupiter layout in between so we also have here kind of some cell boundaries yeah but if, as you see if you focus on the output part there's nothing nothing left it's really just your definition how you would like to make it look and I, I find this a really important part, so that we can, um, yeah, have this, uh, yeah, to, to create really our dashboards, company dashboards, and etc. directly in this notebook. So it's really just just the same, no extra step. What I built here is I imported from from a Julia package actually, because um, the notebook is implemented in in Julia. Um, a little helper package which gives us interactive widgets. So I, I already wrote here also and I told it if someone is interested in, in building the IPython widgets, no one actually came to me. I'm, I'm very sad, but uh, if someone is interested in helping me out, the IPy widgets package would be awesome to support. And we have here now a scrubbable, which you've seen, you can drag and drop it and, and change the value, which is our user input. And we have a, a special function bind, which is now which now takes this user input element, this UI element, and updates a concrete variable with its value. And this is kind of the key thing. And now we can change what we before have been manually coding, yeah, n equals something, yeah, or whatever input you have, yeah, whatever choice you want to make in your dashboard. Um, you can now just replace it by, by some UI element. And it's a very natural flow. You start coding something ex experimentally and then replace parts by, by interactivity. It helps you even in, in experiment mode to, to easily uh, yeah, check alternatives. But it also is a step towards kind of a, a website, a dashboard. I also sometimes call it a, like a live report. And, and we see here now we can integrate it in other um, Markdown code or HTML code. And yeah, and it updates everything automatically. 
So this is kind of the key spirit. Thanks to reactivity, we now transformed a, a notebook which previously has been only experimental ground, yeah, to do some some s research to try out some stuff, and have something which is which is sound, yeah, which is valid, which is already, yeah, a product in a sense, yeah, and and this is, yeah. So let me rephrase. So what what is kind of the key ingredients to get this? We have a super flexible layout, yeah. We have one type of cell only, and the output is whatever rich a HTML you want. And with this, you can really customize this to, to whatever you want. There's no other prefixed design. And we have this reactivity, which m makes that the code is always in a valid state. It's always re-executed. It's always correct, if you want. Or if it's not correct, you see it. So it's more like a script, if you, if you like. Yeah, and scripts, of course, we also use to build products. Yeah, we run a script for whatever, and this is in a sense like a fancy script. Yeah, it has more interactivity. You can easily uh, work with it. You have direct feedback as you like it from Jupyter, but still, it has this the semantics of a script, and that you you have it executed always completely. It's not like an intermediate wrong state. So, and this is the second big point that makes this possible to deploy it as a product. You you really know that yeah if you develop it it's like what I would like to deploy. It's not like in Jupyter you execute the one the other cell and of course you are in a uh, bit chaotic environment in, in Jupyter. And here you always know this is this is like a state which I may deploy, which I may put into a product. Okay, so the last part of it is um, that there's the possibility of making this grab updates from some system. And here's a very, very tiny example, um, which just <laughs> re-executes it again and again and, and shows the time. So it, it's, um, you can mo almost overlook it. But in principle, you can grab updates from another service. Yeah, uh, You have maybe an event system at your company, and you want to listen on events, um, Yeah, or, or just on regular time. So that you regularly grab some updates from some server, and and this is super important, of course. If you if you want to deploy it, you need to make it somehow update to the current state. So yeah, it needs to be up to date. Otherwise, it's not really useful. Ah yeah, um, this is a little tiny thing I I saw today in the morning. We can switch the uh, order from input and output. So now I execute this little helper output below, which switches it. And we have it below, which is here the mode I'm often using. And this is now kind of the key thing. We can have extra functionality, which does some something on the server side. Well, this is kind of, we of course have this in our browser. It's like what we tell client customer. We can also do things on a, on a server side. And here we just repeat it. Um, um, every two seconds by by rounding the next time yeah to to se two seconds, so we repeat this very cell at in two seconds, and you see that it's updating its own automatically. I was not um, yeah it's probably not too long the video is halting then, but this together makes really for whatever you like yeah you can transform data. Uh, just grab it from uh, a topic, from a Kafka topic here and write it to another topic. You can um, do just a, a processing. You grab data at a fixed time, write it to somewhere else. And you can also do kind of just website interfaces. You you upload a PDF file and, and parse it in some way. And you can insert data into a database by using this dashboard yeah, as, as the interface. People can put in data and this updates um, your database in the background. Yeah? You can do the other thing around. You analyze your data from the database. So it's really super flexible. You can do almost all things wh which you usually yeah, want to do in, in, in data applications. Ah, yeah, last part, um, you have also the possibility to have rich output so that you have real, um, it's not working that you have uh, plots. And so I just wanted to include that as you now it's really just like a like a dashboard part. And yeah, CO2 data is always also interesting, but I would like to um, use the time more to get onto the second part.
okay, yeah, a little tiny break, also some some little art from XKCD, another art. I I like this especially. So what's <laughs> this is a self-referencing plot? <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm really curious whether this is kind of true. Yeah, so the the middle plot shows the amount of black by panel. So here is that many black, here is that many black, and here is that many black. And um, yeah, that would be really cool to check whether this actually works. <laughs> um, okay, second part, the deployment. So having this um, reactive notebook, the idea is let's let's make it totally simple. Yeah, to have the base as this reactive notebook that we can build products in no time. And yeah, and one part. Wait, wait, sorry, I was moving back and forth. Ah, yeah, first slide. So there are a couple of whoops, sorry, I yeah there are a couple of features now in the in the cloud. Easiest would be I now show you the cloud, but because live demos haven't been allowed, we now need to to work kind of with the feature set. So if you if you go out there, you see just an overview of your GitHub repositories. This is how how it's structured. You can open new repositories, you can import existing repositories, and I have now a PyData Eindhoven example here yeah and you have a little little uh, what is this um lenses over here which then are different kinds of environments and you can create new ones so the idea is we have a prot environment which always shows kind of the this uh, yeah the result with which is not being able to change but the sliders yeah you have this interactivity which is intended but you don't have the possibility to develop it so a, a viewer perspective so to say yeah and then we have a couple of dev environments i've been working a lot and it's always really awesome to have kind of the possibility to create a separate development environment where you can just change what you want um, and they are put together um, with git version control so Prod is always listening on, on the main branch and grabbing what, what was changed. And these are on different branches. They always have their the separate uh, independent branch so that you really can work smoothly together. Um, yeah, and you can create whatever other branch you like for a feature request, but you can also work together on, on one part. So it's possible that if one works on the notebook, some other opens the same URL. They just work together on the notebook and see each other's changes. So this collaborative feature is also there. And so this is one part of the integration in a company setting. Um, this slide, yeah, it just shows that there's um, an easy entry. If you start working with this, you also get a couple of example notebooks. So what you see here is that it supports all three standard languages, I would say, for doing data science, Julia, Python, and R. And Julia is there for a while, actually. Julia is, uh, so this reactive notebook is built in Julia, it's first supported, and what I added now the last months is Python and R. So and this is what you've already seen, kind of on the Python side, it's really a super new thing. Uh, previously, only Julia was supported, and now the other languages as well. And yeah. Welcome dashboards and streams are the three examples which are there so that people can easily get started. And the last important video, I think, and we may go through it a bit um, slower, let's see, um, is this one. So the key parts now that we have the development and the production, which are there to change it and then for the final view. And we can use the very same notebook to also bridge this gap. So usually in, in these yeah, development settings, you have automated tests as the bridge. If you change something, yeah, before making it live, yeah, to make it into the product, you usually want to run automated tests in some way. And the cool thing is now because this notebook is stored as a Python file, you can just run the Python file as a simple test. And and in the in the notebook we can also kind of do extra checks, like if we are in the test environment, we can check this or this extra. And this makes kind of a really smooth, complete product life cycle.
Yeah, we use the very same notebook for all stages. We develop it by changing the part, yeah. We test it by just running it one one time through, yeah. And then we have the product at the end, which is just the same notebook, but without the possibility to, to change the code part. And this is super intuitive and let's take a look into it. So I hope this video is also playing. Yeah, so I'm at the front end and going into the dev envir environment. And now I'm um, seeing a couple of example um, notebooks which are different because it's a bit older recording of mine. And I changed a couple of things in my Python notebook. And now I have a little interface which ha says update production. I can put a title and a description. It will update and give me a link to GitHub. This will have created automatically uh, a pull request. And this pull request oh, it was really fast. Okay, so we we, we look into it again. Um, um, it lags a little bit. Be patient with me. Yeah. Okay. So we go into the dev environment. Um, we see. And an overview of our notebooks, we've changed something to the Python notebook. We enter a little description of our changes and then request an update, which translates this into a GitHub pull request. And we can jump there. And now using kind of just standard GitHub, we, we can discuss, we can look into the file changes, which is just really just a plain Python file. And um wait a second okay so this uh, is a bit more difficult than hoped for it doesn't jump back when i want to jump back it usually should hold okay i'm going over it uh, a third time but it seems like the So, okay, and the, the key part is now that we have an automated testing, which is really totally automated. So uh, someone who is using this notebook doesn't need to tinker with it. It's, um, it grabs all the files and just runs them automatically. And the key thing I want to highlight is um, this part over here. Some checks haven't completed yet, so it completes one line for each notebook and tests it. I think we, we should leave it with that. Um, this I, I, I was not aware that I pressed next now and we are on the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so this is the key part, having kind of development, test and production all in one. And you can use it without real knowledge of Git. Yeah, you see this Git pull request is the thing where we can kind of integrate with existing version control best practice that's there, but you don't need to understand Git for it. Yeah. So you just use it, you make comments there and tell, please change this. You go back to the notebook and change it. And you do another update request and, and the pull request will update itself. And if you have actually complex merge situations which appear in version control, someone changed this, another one changed this, then this is also handled for you. There's an automatic, um, yeah, resolution process, which will then just have the conflicting files next to each other. You can look into both, yeah, and you decide what you want to, to keep, the other one you delete. And this whole process doesn't need in-depth Git knowledge. Actually, you don't need to execute a single Git command, but you still have this integrated version control. So, so this is really also simplified. And, and all this is kind of powered by this reactive notebook being so simple and that it can be the same yeah, at the same time the experimental the experiment environment as well as then um, the final product. Okay, so behind the scene a couple of technologies are used. Um, main technology here is Kubernetes actually because it needs to run somewhere and this is also what I envision for the future plan. Namely, um, I also want this to support big data. On the Julia side, there's a couple. There's a currently, uh, yeah, one thing which is missing. Um, I hope for that it's going to be there in the next year, so that 
Julia Big Data, in a sense, can be activated from the notebook. From the Python side, I think it's even simpler. It's just that the Python support wasn't there since yeah, a couple of weeks. And, and it would also be nice to have the Py, PySpark cluster just readily available, and also or array cluster. And the thing this would work is just that you start a cluster in the notebook. You say, give me 10 machines. Yeah? And because it's a Kubernetes cluster, it gives you 10 machines. Yeah? And then you can interact with these machines. And then finally, you say, if I did everything, thank you, um, then I destroy my cluster again. And I was always missing this kind of approach when I myself had been doing big data. Like the configuration of what resources I want was always done outside my script. And I dislike this a little bit, yeah, that you have this configuration extra and you need to manage it extra. And then this approach here would be kind of really, you have your script and your script does what your script does. And, and it says, give me five extra machines to, that I can do my computation and you get five extra machines to, to do your computation. And you can also make this then, of course, much more dynamically, yeah. So you can check the data, yeah. I have so much data and hence I need so, so many machines, yeah. And I, I miss this in, in current big data setting. And I, I really hope that um, the big data support is there and it's set up on Kubernetes exactly to support also this use case. It's just yeah, one, one further step which needs to be done. And the notebook itself is uh, called actually Pluto in the Julia world. And yeah, run also with Julia. And I actually by now also got a little sticker, a Pluto sticker. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think um, this is the key. Yeah, so a little summary. So you can use this reactive notebook for almost everything which you like in data. Experiment, dashboard, transform events, building pipelines. And big data is plan of the future. And then you, you can go to cloudjolin.io, um, which is as of now already hosted reactive notebook service. Just log in with GitHub and you can use it. You can collaborate with your team on the same. Um, notebook, but you can also just create um, different environments which are completely separate, which is also really nice. And you have this dev test prod complete automation. So that's super simple to, to create dashboards just by, by following this uh, reactive notebook style. I usually give one month free access, so please be welcome to try it out and look whether it fits your, uh, your needs. Okay. And yeah, this is my, my last slide with a little LinkedIn QR code. So you are welcome to follow me. And yeah, thank you. Hi, Esteban. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for uh, this presentation. I have, uh, I'm wondering about uh, your product. Uh, what is your niche audience? I am trying to think, uh, are you trying to target a team of, I don't know, data scientists that they want to go work together, but they don't need to know Git, but probably uh, many data scientists know Git. Uh, and I, I'm trying to figure out exactly who are, can we sell the product? Because I think that there is a big potential as where you are, you are showing here that there is a dev uh, option where the developers can actually work and a broad option that you can actually show to your client, client facing. So my question is like, what exactly, what niche are you targeting uh, as a company in your startup? Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, so, so the history is really like, I, I got, I saw this notebook, yeah, this reactive notebook in the Julia world. And I thought this would be kind of a, a relatively easy plug and play solution, which, which really gives a, a benefit. So it's more like low hanging fruit, which motivated to go in this direction. And it's so much so important to find kind of the customers who would really benefit from this. And this is currently a process which I'm in to, to really understand who is rather the target group, which would be early enthusiasts in this realm. In the long run, I, I envision that this is really kind of something which can simplify a lot of companies data science setup. So I've been working in a couple of companies where, where you have engineers, then maybe some data scientists, and then you still have another group yeah, of more data analysts, which use 
BI tools, Tableau, yeah, to, to create final dashboards. And I, I always felt like this is quite a complexity. Yeah. So, and, and I hope that the reactive notebook is able to kind of unify this a bit more. We have another talk of DBT currently at the other side going. This is also a motivator, yeah, where, where people kind of build systems which rather yeah, bring people together from these sides. Yeah. DBT does it via SQL and, and this does it via kind of being script like, yeah. And and be yeah, writing scripts is still something completely simpler, much simpler than programming in a full sense. And it's kind of an another sweet spot between these parts. Yeah, but, but I, I really hope that it still can do the same for force, yeah, that to bring people together from these different parts so that you don't have the team boundaries and resource boundaries between them, yeah, until you get the product out there. But you can really just bring out a product within two days, yeah. And just because it's so so unified. And there really every company comes into play. It's just that they won't be the first early adopters. And it's a bit hard to to really get it to to the target group which could also be early adopters. Yeah. Awesome question. Thank you very much. So one thing that you mentioned is that you heavily um, that all all of the things that you do are heavily based on Pluto, mm -hmm. and when I checked it out like l one year ago, it didn't support Python and R yet. And you also mentioned that you added that. Did you add that specifically to Trollin.io, or do you now have your own fork, or have you contributed that upstream? Or how does this work? Oh, that's a perfect question. Yeah, I was expecting this even earlier today, but yeah, it, it comes now. So indeed, it's currently on my own fork. Um, there it's live and upstream and can be tested. But for the long run, it's definitely planned to get this part in open source. It's not planned to get every part in op into open source, which is there on cloud.jowland.io. So it's they definitely intended to be a, on to stay a custom fork. But the Python support, and um, it especially the Python support, the R support is actually a bit more tricky, but Python just works lovely. Yeah, that's full support kind of. This would be great to get out into um, the, the mainstream Pluto branch, the mainstream Pluto repository. And it's just because of personal resources, it's more goal for the next year. So I won't focus on this within the next month, but I'll rather focus on, on getting to the right early adopter target group <laughs> and and get traction on really making this a sustainable business. Yeah. But it's definitely planned to, to have this Python support there to yeah to circumvent this vendor login so that the core part is really open and then people can be sure to to use whatever they build outside of cloud .io. Thank, you. thank you for the question Stefan, thanks thanks a lot i think uh, uh yeah, I think we are, are yeah, exactly. yeah, we are on time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Then. So uh, you're happy to reach out? Also yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Let's, let's uh, give uh, an applause and thanks a lot for, for this inspiring presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.